Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today I'm pleased to welcome an author whose most recent book compelled me to invite him on our show. The book is entitled Off the Radar, A Father's Secret, A Mother's Heroism, and a Son's Quest. And the author is Cyrus Copeland. Cyrus, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Cyrus, for those people who have not yet read your book, I want to start by just giving a quick overview. You're the son of an American father and an Iranian mother. Your family was living in Tehran because your father worked there for Westinghouse in 1979 during the Iranian revolution and conversion to the Islamic Republic led by the Ayatollah Khomeini. Your father was arrested, tried and convicted of being a CIA spy. 35 years later, after finding a file on your father, you conducted your own investigation to find out for yourself whether or not he really was a CIA agent. Is that a fair, quick summary of the premise of the book? Perfect Reader's Digest version. Is it fair to say that neither the CIA nor the State Department gave you any help at all in trying to discover the truth about your dad? Uh, that is fair to say, uh, in spite of the fact that I had a very high profile lawyer who very kindly did pro bono work uh, on my behalf, um, I, they were not particularly helpful. Uh, I filed multiple FOIA requests uh, to get information about my father, uh, and um, they, they weren't very forthcoming. And a FOIA request is a freedom of information, correct? You've written the book in the style of creative nonfiction, as if it were a novel. How were you able to flesh out conversations and events that took place in such detail? For example, your father's failed attempt to escape to Turkey, or your father's conversations with the New Zealand diplomat Richard Sewell? Yeah, the, great question. Um, I, I relied on a, a variety of sources. Uh, I relied on uh, my mother's uh, recollection of things. Uh, my father's notes uh, that he had made. At one point, he intended to write a book about his own experiences in Iran, and uh, for one reason or another, that that didn't happen. Uh, I relied on conversations, for example, with uh, New Zealand diplomats who were still uh, living, all of whom were kind of able to kind of add uh, to what I already knew. And then, quite frankly, honestly, um, a part of it, I just kind of had to go with uh, what I felt had been said at the time, based on what I knew. Your father, Max Copeland, was a fascinating man. He had a PhD in Iranian education. He'd been invited by the Shah of Iran to recruit American professors to teach at the university there. And then he was hired by Westinghouse in Iran. As far as you know, what was he hired to do? By Westinghouse. Yes. Uh, he, was uh, he was hired to shut down their operations in Iran after the revolution started. And it quickly became apparent that Westinghouse could no longer be a going concern. Um, did you ever see that movie, Michael Clayton? My father was like the George Clooney character in that movie. Basically, he was the cleanup man. So he was there to liquidate the homes and the possessions of Westinghouse employees and send everything back to America, correct? Not just the homes and the possessions, but also this very sensitive military equipment that Westinghouse had sold to the Iranian Air Force. Well, I'm going to get to that now. Max was arrested when a carton from Westinghouse in Tehran headed to the United States, was intercepted by the Iranian authorities, and found to contain military, electronic, and radar equipment. Because your father was in charge of Westinghouse at that time, he was accused of trying to smuggle this equipment out of the country. You say in the book that it's not clear that he ever knew what was in that carton, correct? Yes, it became apparent to me that he didn't know and that in fact that carton had been packed by another Westinghouse employee who did know what was in it because it was kind of camouflaged by the very sensitive radar equipment that was camouflaged with household goods. And so therein lies really the source of the investigation. Was your father an innocent victim uh, because somebody else packed that carton and he didn't know what was in it? Or was he part of some kind of a conspiracy to export this uh, very sensitive equipment? Yeah, and for me, uh, honestly, Harvey, the investigation, if you will, went a little bit beyond that. I wanted to know 
not just if my father had been guilty of the things that he had been accused of by the revolutionaries, but whether in fact he had been um, a spy for the CIA. Well, to me, it's very clear early on in the book that you were not just trying to find out if your father was guilty of being a spy. You were actually trying to find out who your father really was. You described him in the book as being a mystery to you. What was so yeah. mysterious about him? Oh, God. Um, well, you know, let me kind of preface this by saying that uh, I have always had more of an emotional identification with my mother. My mother was the uh, solar light to whom uh, our family turned, and my father was a little bit more distant and lunar, both emotionally as, as well as um, in ways that were difficult for me as a boy to understand and relate to. And so you're absolutely right. Uh, this wasn't only about my trying to find out whether my dad was CIA, but it was in some sense who he, uh, trying to discover who he was. Uh, and in doing so, not just telling his story and the story of our relationship, uh, but also drawing the, an emotional thread between myself and my father a little bit closer many, many years after he had died. When the revolution started in Iran, almost every American got out of the country because it was exceedingly dangerous for an American to be there. Why did your parents stay? I think my mother wanted to stay. My mother is a very proud daughter of Iran. She still considers herself uh, to be a daughter of Iran to this very day. And I don't think that she realized that depth and breadth and magnitude of these iconic changes that were happening under our very feet. Um, I don't think anybody did, uh, honestly. I mean, people knew that change was afoot. A lot of people knew that this was a very necessary, uh, a good time to just kind of decamp, if you will. But my mom is very patriotic. She loves her country. My father also uh, loved Iran deeply. And so I think she was reluctant, even as he started to feel very sensitive about the situation and the anti-American sentiment that was going on at the time. My mother found a way to brush it off a little bit. Your father's arrest in 1979 was during the U.S. Embassy hostage crisis. Iran demanded that the U.S. return the Shah back to Iran or else they would kill the hostages. Now, ultimately, the six U.S. diplomats got out of Iran, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. But did you ever find out why your father was not included in the plan to rescue those six diplomat hostages? So you're talking about the famous uh, Argos uh, uh, addendum to the storyline, right? Yeah. Um, I didn't. I just knew that uh, the plug had been pulled on that very secret operation that nobody in the world found out about until I accidentally found out about it uh, by a visit of a friend of mine to the Jimmy Carter Library and the discovery of a single line in uh, a telex that indicated that it wasn't just Argo. There was actually a, uh, an operation which was run by the same people who were responsible for delivering um, the, the U.S. diplomats. Uh, and that was done in tandem at the same time, only miles from uh, where we lived. And I never discovered why the operation was pulled. I could kind of put those, uh, put those pieces together. Uh, and and uh, I, I did a little bit in that chapter of the book. But as you might imagine, the CIA was no more uh, inclined to help me <laughs> talk about how they had run a secret operation than they were about any other other aspects of my father's uh, life and the operation that he was running over there. Well, one of the most uh, intriguing and exciting parts of your book deals with a plan by the New Zealand diplomat Richard Sewell to smuggle your father out of the country as a New Zealand meat inspector, and that plan yeah. failed. Uh, I, I, I'll leave it for people to read the book to find out uh, how that plan was going to go ahead and why it failed. But while we're on the topic of the American hostages, what did you think of the Ben Affleck movie Argo, which dealt with that situation? No, Harvey, uh, as a moviegoer, I found it to be a really good, muscular, well-told tale. 
as an Iranian American who lived through that time uh, and knows the truth of uh, Iranian history and culture, I was very disappointed uh, by the predictably ham-handed way that they portrayed Iran and what was going on um, at the time. For me, it was very telling that there's only one good, good Iranian in that movie. And it's the Canadian ambassador's maid. And the only reason she's actually a good character or a good Iranian, if you will, is because she helps the Americans escape. So I understand how uh, conflict is put together. I understand how uh, tales need to be told cinematically, but uh, watching that for me as an Iranian American was hurtful um, and disappointing uh, because it missed a really good opportunity to delve into the truth of, uh, of the real Iran that very few people these days talk about or know about. And that movie did much more harm in that regard than it did good. Well, Cyrus, I know that your father was the principal focus of your book, but for me, the most fascinating person is your mother, Shaheen. She was the youngest woman to leave Iran unchaperoned when she was 17. She stood up numerous times to Iran's foreign minister to help her husband. When your father couldn't find a lawyer, she became the first female lawyer in the Islamic Republic so she could defend him at his trial. She ultimately got him out of Iran. She was a BBC broadcaster, a successful realtor. What a formidable woman. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Uh, I will pass along uh, your, your admiration to my mom when I chat with her <laughs> later today. Uh, I love her, uh, not only because she's my mother, but because she's such an improbable woman. And the uh, depth and breadth of the life that she's led is truly remarkable to me. Um, she did all of those things. And yet, if you uh, talk to her, you know, sometimes I'll get fan mail. Um, about her, and I'll subsequently call her up and read her a letter or an email. And she always kind of professes a degree of befuddlement because she can't understand why people think this is uh, anything remarkable. She just kind of did what she needed to do. Um, I think to this day, she still doesn't realize how improbable uh, of a woman she is, honestly. Will you please tell her that I can't wait for her to write her book and to get her on my show? <laughs> I will. Your father was the first and last American to be tried by the Ayatollah's regime. The trial lasted five hours. Your mother defended him. He was convicted and sentenced to 20 years, but he was given house arrest. How did your mother manage to persuade the authorities to allow him to stay home rather than go to that awful jail? I don't think that she actually persuaded the judge to do that. I think that the judge was looking for a way to kind of hold the contradictions between the very compelling argument that the prosecutor had delivered against my father and his desire to kind of help my mother and her husband through a very difficult, uh, sensitive situation. So uh, I credit not only my mother and her capacity to argue the case of my dad uh, before an Islamic court using only the Quran as um, evidence. Because, right, that version of the law that you and I are used to, the Western law, is no longer there. And uh, the new law is Islamic law. And my mother would come home, a little bit of background, my mother would come home every night. I remember this still to this day with such clarity. And she would put her feet up on uh, the Ottoman and she would open the Quran and she would cast about looking for defense strategies for my father in her holy book. She'd make notes. Um, she had several weeks to kind of prepare her trial uh, and uh, she did it. She delivered it with aplomb. I still to this day can't believe that she actually do what she, did what she did. I can't either. In January 1980, your mother managed to get herself, you and your sister out of Iran and into the United States. That's a whole other chapter worth reading. So there you were a teenager getting accustomed to life in America and you suddenly become obsessed with the Timothy Hutton character in the movie, Ordinary People. Why? Oh my God. Um, first of all, <laughs> you for in all the interviews that I've done for this book, no one has ever talked about that. But for me, that was such telling emotional moment in my own life where this kid, Timothy Hutton, uh, is 
looking for a way through a very uh, awful chapter of his life to just kind of pull himself up from the rubble of it. And in doing so, to forge a new emotional connection with his dad, who's always been at arm's length with him. Uh, and in the Tim Hutton movie, he, um, he finds a way through mining his own personal pain to get to a new deeper truth about who he was with his dad. And so in some way for me, writing this book and telling the narrative of um, not just my mother's very improbable accomplishments, but also the narrative of my father's life, i have able to kind of uh, make a peace with um, my dad by putting his life and our life in the most difficult chapter of his life into story form. And so for me, ordinary people became one very beautiful crystalline moment uh, that I, in so many years ago, it's still so resonant for me that I thought, my God, this is just echoing in my own life and it feels so true. Yeah, I'm surprised no one else asked you about that because I, it really resonated with me when I read it. So I'm glad I did ask you about it. Yeah, thank you for that. While we're on the subject of movies, you did not like the Sally Field movie, Not Without My Daughter. Why? <laughs> for the same reason, times 10, that I didn't like Argo. Uh, it just took every really bad stereotype about uh, Iran and Islam and jumbled it all together and slapped it up onto the screen and delivered a very fearful version of Iran to uh, American audiences everywhere who. I'm sure interpreted that as the truth. Now, if people want to find out exactly how your mother managed to get your father out of Iran, they will have to read the book. But I must tell you, Cyrus, that your description of what happened at the airport was absolutely spine tingling, nail biting suspense. Where did you learn to write like that? This is nothing like your other books. Uh, you're right. <laughs> it's really not. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know how to answer that, Harvey, except to say that um, I've always had an interest in uh, writing and in storytelling. Storytelling has always had a profound influence on me. I never really saw myself as a storyteller, but in, uh, in getting the story of what happened to our family down on the page, I realized that this is uh, interesting, kind of electrifying. At times, uh, I'm puffing up my chest here, but spine tingling, tingling uh, material and that moment when uh that you're talking about is um is one such moment and when i was writing that i myself was kind of reliving it from my father's and my mother's perspective and felt the same electricity coursing uh through me well it certainly coursed through the reader i'll tell you i couldn't put your book down mm, thank you that's Mother one thing writers aim for they aim for the whole i couldn't put your book down or uh, emotional kind of catharsis, or I couldn't get to my household duties, any or all of those kind of reactions are all really so sweet and validating for, uh, <laughs> for writers. Well, I'm lucky as a reader, because if I love the book, I can invite the author to come on my show. And so far, they've all said yes. So I'm very grateful for that. Uh, are you kidding? The pleasure is entirely mine. Your father ended up dying of a heart attack at the age of 57. You wrote that you were not happy with the eulogy that you delivered at his funeral. Why? Well, uh, at the time that I delivered it, it felt uh, very real and actually spoke at length about a moment that he and I shared in a valley, and he and I and my sister shared in a valley in Iran. And as I look back on my time in Iran, uh, that was one of not just the best days of my time there, but the best days of my life when I felt like we were perched on the discovery of an entirely new Narnia-like magical valley that nobody knew about. Uh, and that later, in fact, I discovered was called the Valley of Lost Paradise. Uh, it was a powerful moment for me, but when I delivered my doubt eulogy, I had never done a eulogy before, uh, and I, at the time, didn't see myself as a writer either. I was still working as an ad man, and so uh, I guess I hoped that the import and the depth and dimension of that moment would translate better uh, as a remembrance when I shared it with his uh, with. The, the bereaved <laughs> that were gathered there. Um, at the time I thought it did, but when I went back and reread it later in the context of other 
great eulogies that had been delivered because that later became kind of a, um, a passion for mine. I thought to myself, oh my God, this wasn't nearly as good as I thought it was. Is that why you've written three books about eulogies? You know, I still can't explain why I did that, Harvey. Um, I became, after my father's, after I delivered my father's eulogy, I thought to myself, I should do a book of eulogies to people who made their lives count. And uh, I did what we all do with those flashes of inspiration, which is to say nothing, until 9-11 happened. I'm, I, I'm a New Yorker. And uh, I remember remember still all these magnificent remembrances that are echoing throughout every single church in the city. And that was when the inspiration to do a book of eulogies came roaring back so many years later. And so I did. Uh, I left my career in advertising behind and I, uh, I, I edited a book of uh, eulogies of famous artists, writers, scientists, politicians, basically people who changed the way the world works. And um, that, in, after the, in the wake of 9-11, became a very uh, emotionally nourished, soul-nourishing way for me to pull myself through uh, a, a dark chapter. I ended up through no fault of, uh, through no anticipation or planning of my own becoming a, a lecturer on the funeral director circuit about how funeral directors can help their, uh, the bereaved uh, deliver great, uh, greater remem remembrances for their loved ones. So in that way, my father's death and the eulogy that I delivered uh, in the wake of it, so many years later, in some sense, gave me uh, new life. Your book, Farewell, Godspeed, The Greatest Eulogies of Our Time, is a remarkable collection of eulogies from the funerals of some of the most famous people in the world. I have to tell you, Cyrus, I loved it because every eulogy made me feel like I got to know the person being eulogized. Which was your favorite? Oh, I loved the one of Betty Davis because I'm a huge fan. <laughs> me too. Uh, that is one of my favorite, and I love... I love, love, love uh, the closing line. The closing line is uh, it is lifted from the All About Eve uh, screenplay and James Woods. Yes. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy eternity. <laughs> well, getting back to Off the Radar, would your father have approved of this book? Oh, uh, I feel uh, like my father was with me throughout the writing of it, was in some sense an, an agent uh, of discovery for me. I, I, I can't explain how I feel this, and I, but I know it to be true that he also kind of made things happen. Um, and so I have to assume that he, uh, by dint of his involvement, not just emotional, but spiritual in a way, uh, would have approved uh, of it. And certainly of, my, one of the chief hopes I had for this book, which is to hold the contradiction between my Iranian self and my American self. And uh, in doing so, revisit a very a difficult, uh, iconic time at which we Copelands lived at the nexus of that and use that as a... Uh, I don't want to kind of get all preachy here, but it's a teaching moment for what is yet possible between two such contradictory cultures. Is there any thought of making the book into a movie? Oh, I would love that. Uh, it's a, I mean, I think it's a very cinematic book. Um, and my mother in particular kind of comes off as a very interesting uh, female uh, role model at a time when we're kind of talking about female empowerments, but this was like 35, 40 years ago, and she was actually living it and doing it in the middle of a very, in a very difficult time and in the middle of a very patriarchal culture. Um, I think it would make a great movie, you know, and that's important to me that if it's done, it not be done in an Argo like way, but in a way which really kind of deeply explores the truth of not just uh, our family dynamics, but also the uh, the relationship between Iran and America. So I would like it to be with uh, an actress who could convey that, the, the, the kind of, not just have a cast iron spine, but also somebody who's got a lot of emotional 
smarts and wisdom. Cyrus, in 2014, you went to Iran. You were the son of a fugitive who escaped Iran. What made you decide to go there? Weren't you afraid of being arrested? Uh, I had a little anxiety about uh, going back to the country, but no sooner did I get off the airplane than I realized that my anxiety had been the byproduct of living uh, in a culture that uh, portrays Iran in the ways that unfortunately America does on the screen and on television is just a very uh, angry fist in the air, death to America place. The truth is that Iran is not that. Um, Iran, <laughs> it's the most, you know, Harvey, I honestly think it's the most misunderstood country on the world stage these days. And all anybody does is, uh, needs to do is go to Iran to discover how incredibly hospitable the Iranian people are, how rich the culture is, uh, and, um, how it is just a country that is so achingly beautiful that it begs to be known. And it, it isn't for the time being. And uh, so in the weeks that I spent there, it was not only for me an occasion to revisit the land of my childhood so many years later, and also to tie up the emotional loose ends of my story, but also to disprove to myself all of uh, these ideas and, and concerns and fears and anxieties that had built up in my head for so many years. One of the most fascinating parts of your book is your discussion of what it feels like to be half American and half Iranian. You have two homelands whose governments have great antipathy towards each other. You wrote that you don't really feel totally at home in either country. Why? Because I feel like I'm always doing the work of ambassadorship in a way. Uh, in Iran, uh, I don't look Iranian, and although I speak Farsi, I kind of stick out a little bit like a sore thumb, and I make a point of introducing myself uh, to everyone that I meet as an American in the hopes that they will know that America doesn't equal maybe what they thought it equaled. Similarly, over here, uh, I am proudly Iranian and uh, hope to be um, a spokesperson, if you will. You know what, I, I, I don't like kind of uh, living a role, but I, I feel like this has been a role which is thrust on me uh, by the life that I've lived. And so uh, I, I do it open heartedly. So I'll make jokes about uh, being everyone's favorite Iranian, but I'm very pointedly Iranian American here. And because of the enmity between Iran and America, uh, it's been a challenging role. I, I liken it to what it's like being a child of divorce, where uh, your mother calls your father the great Satan, and he says that she's the axis of evil, and me and all the other divorced kids are left at this very uncomfortable point in between, trying to, just hoping, essentially, that our parents will get back together. You wrote in your book that Iran is misunderstood by America because there's a disconnect between the Iranian government's official anti-American sentiment and the mentality of the Iranian people who are obsessed with everything that comes from America. Did that surprise you when you got there? It surprised me by how well they knew America, how they had um, none of the kind of... Uh, misperceptions about America that Americans have about Iran. Uh, in large part, that's because uh, they get a fair amount of um, American storytelling over there. They see American movies, American music, uh, in the same way that we kind of don't, we don't get that about Iranian uh, history and culture. Although I will say this, that the Iranian movies that have made it over here uh, have done a really lovely, lovely job of um, uh, reversing uh, those uh, stereotypes. Okay. I had such a great time uh, when I was in Iran. I miss it. I still miss it. I hope to go back soon someday. What's your opinion of the economic sanctions on Iran? Are they having the desired effect? Here's the truth about sanctions. The sanctions hurt the people. Uh, and they have hurt the people. And uh, I, it's just very sorrowful for me to watch uh, the degree of misery that they have foisted on a population of 100 million people.
what do you think the future holds for Iran? The situation at the moment does not look good. I am very super hopeful uh, that President Biden uh, will uh, reach across this sea of misunderstanding left in the wake of four years of uh, terrible, terrible diplomacy uh, of the Trump administration and uh, see what we can do to repair uh, our relationship with them. I'm really hopeful about that, actually. So, Cyrus, you did your investigation. You came to your conclusions about your father, which I'm not going to reveal. People will have to read the book to find that out. You wrote the book. You've come to terms with his legacy. What's the greatest lesson you learned from your father's life? You know, the thing that my dad was really good at was curiosity. It was a sense of curiosity that delivered him from uh, a, a ranch in Oklahoma to an international program at the University of Oklahoma, which took him all the way around the world and uh, really kind of taught him how to kind of cross over borders. In a way, it's the same lesson that I learned from my mom, uh, who left Iran at such a tender age. She was the youngest woman to leave Iran unchaperoned at the time and made a life, uh, as you noted, for, as a model an announcer for the BBC in England. Both my parents left what they knew for the horizon. And in doing so, uh, vested me with a curiosity about uh, what lies beyond our borders, not just our national borders, but also our borders of thought, our borders of morality, our borders of culture, our borders of religion. And uh, my parents, in being the people that they were, gave me that on a very cellular level. And in reconstructing uh, their lives and putting them on the page, uh, I reaffirmed for myself the power that comes with curiosity and the questions of who are, who am I in the world and what's possible about my own life. So what's next for Cyrus Copeland? Any other books in the works? <laughs> I got a couple of projects I'm working on right now. Uh, the book that I'm, uh, the book, uh, that I am working on is a, um, it's a religious and spiritual travel uh, memoir. And I don't know how others, are, how other authors are, uh, but I, I'm one of those authors that doesn't kind of like to talk a whole lot about what he's working on because there's a certain electricity that I want to make sure it gets kind of translated onto the page instead of my kind of yapping about it. Uh, so l let me, if I may, leave it at that. It's a, uh, it's a religious travel memoir that's taking me around the world. I think that's enough to whet our appetites. Ah, thank you. Well, Cyrus, thank you so much for writing the book and for sharing your family's remarkable history. I hope that our audience will be inspired to read it. And I thank you so much for taking the time to be on our show. Harvey, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and thank you for also one, one of the most interesting interviews I have uh, ever done. You. Uh, your command of the material and your willingness to kind of delve into it and to push me a little bit beyond the borders of questions that I have already been asked and get into new territory. Uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate you. Thank you for doing what you do so well. And just thank you for asking interesting questions. I've done so many interviews. And so it's really lovely for me to kind of wade into uh, a new way of looking at the material so many years later. I, I deeply thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Oh, it's, it's a great honor. Uh, that's why I wanted to embark on this interview program, because I felt there was a lack of in-depth interviews out there for celebrities and authors. On behalf of people who write and sell books, uh, I just want to say a big, big uh, mucho gracias. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Cyrus. Our guest has been author Cyrus Copeland. I'm Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on harveybrownstoneinterviews.com.